Hey there, everybody. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, I'm still alive. Wow. Um, it has been a journey for the past two months. Um, some of you might have noticed that the um, that my upload started to sort of tail off a little bit. Um, some of you know the story, so just bear with me. Um, there'll be a surprise at the end. The last few pages will break your heart. No. Um, <laughs> so uh, essentially, I started to suffer what's called long COVID um, post uh, sort of what, what do they call post viral symptoms. And that is where you have like a kind of a draggy hangover of COVID symptoms, but you don't actually have COVID, right? It's just the the after effects you know, and like you could have had it a year ago or two years ago or whatever. I didn't actually catch COVID until April of last year um, after going to a rehearsal with about, um, must have been about 120, 130 people, right? So somebody was bound to infect me. Okay, so um, I had post-COVID syndrome last year and then I had it and I guess I just started picking it up and I, I've had it for eight weeks. And then this happened. The real thing <laughs> just um, started a couple days after my son came back from his end of the school year, um, end of the school year picnic. OK, so I guess in a post COVID, it's like a post viral sort of a state, you can actually catch COVID again. So that is what happened. <laughs> and um, yeah, so like but the weird thing about it is that like when I was going through my eight, when, you know, I've been going through my eight weeks of, um, of like long COVID, it just felt like I was carrying like a sack of bricks on my back. But the, um, but like with actual COVID, my body's fighting back just, and it's just like, you know, I just feel like I'm suddenly on this roller coaster ride instead of just walking around with a huge backpack, uh, overloaded backpack. Um, so, you know, I mean, I could probably have struggled through and continue to work on uploads and, and maybe video content and so on and so forth. But one of the problems about long COVID is brain fog. OK, and, um, you know, like people might say, well, what's your superpower, Thomas? Well, you've got your ambidextrous. Is that a superpower? I was actually watching a video on how ambidextrous is a superpower. <laughs> you know, it's like. It, it is not at all. It's like whatever you're incompetent at, you're incompetent at with both hands. You know, it's it, it's it is not a superpower. Um, you know, are you like is your intelligence your superpower? Well, I mean, I mean, you know, most people who go this far into this particular stream in the arts, um, you know, like you've got to have some kind of intelligence and passion and so on. Is your passion your superpower? I would say if I had a superpower, it would probably be hyper-focus and random association, right? So I could be hyper-focused on a topic, and then at the same time, I can be randomly associating with a bunch of different related things. And then that all makes, I feel that makes my content much stronger. And especially when I'm just looking at somebody's score and um, commenting and and giving them feedback and stuff, I feel that, that that's how I can be the most helpful. And, you know, going through brain fog, <clears throat> that is why I sort of tail things off because I didn't want to give people, you know, 80 percent, 60 percent, 30 percent like I've been feeling. Um, so, I mean, I'm better off just sitting in bed, um, you know, writing the occasional tip for my Patreon crowd, um, you know, and releasing that. Than I am um, doing the videos right now. So yeah, so people have been saying things. Oh yeah, okay. Hi Charles, um, my buddy Charles Gaskell just dropped in, um, and some other familiar faces: Arna, Roque, Daniel Reeves, James. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, yeah, so so people have been saying things like, "Oh, it's okay, you know, if you want to, you know, if we have to finish up like you know January, February, it might be what it's gonna take." Um, but uh, what I would, I think that this is a really good opportunity to talk about something like maybe a kind of a little way to make up. 
And that is a thing that Patreon just started. And that is what's called free memberships. Okay. And um, this is like, like as soon as the free memberships opened up, I didn't even know about it. Right. <laughs> and somehow like it was announced, maybe people who had been my supporters before <clears throat> um, found out about it. And then I got like, I, uh, I got over a hundred signups or as it was, it was 99. That's right. It was 99 signups. And then since then more people have signed up. So look, you know, you do not have to pay me anything and you would have access to some content that I've been working on. And I've decided to make, you know, as part of the whole free content thing, I've decided to make, um, hang on, let me, let me make this. Yeah. So I've been doing a, um, a series on alto clef reading. Okay. So, cause I, I really feel, you know, I'm seeing some basic mistakes in, um, in some of the entries I've been getting and some of the things people have been posting on, um, on in the groups and, and just, you know, just in general, just the vibe that I'm getting is people's alto clef reading is just really not where it should be. So this is a series, anybody can, you know, just join the free membership and, and check this out. Um, like, so, and, and actually what's cool about this is that it's, you know, the series, like first I start you with pitch recognition, right? So first of all, like figuring out a system, like when I was taught, um, pitch recognition for, for alto clef. I mean, I'd been reading alto clef for years, but my, my teacher didn't know that he just said, okay, it's just, you know, every, you know, <clears throat> every line in space is one pitch lower and then played an octave lower. But I mean, like that didn't really help. Right. So I thought of this way. So if you check out the diagram, if you think of middle C in the middle, you know, and that is the middle line. And then this this uh, fancy treble clef sign is actually the symbol of a G. And that um, is the top of the staff. And then this the bass clef is also known as the F clef. That's, that's the lowest line and so on. Um, so, yeah, so this is... Um, um, I've got flashcard training and, um, and I have some formulas, right? You know, face G and good boys do fine. Ha, ha. And, uh, you know, and then also just thinking of formulas for the lower notes, right? Um, the a, B, a and B below the staff, like you might possibly run into that with alto trombone, maybe. Like if somebody's like really writing something kind of, kind of wild using those, you know, those second partials. But, um, but yeah, but like you run into these ones here, you know, HGB and BDFA, right? Or you think of that as a B half diminished chord. So, um, and then <clears throat> what's cool about this post is that um, at the very bottom here, um, I've got PDFs so you can actually print up your own set of flashcards. Okay, these are these were made by me. Now these are on kind of flimsy um heavy paper but it's it, obviously it's not opaque uh but um but they're you know you could print it on um like four by six uh stock if you are in the states or u.s letter four up on u.s letter and then you could just like i've got cut marks on the paper uh, or on the print um or or you could do a6 which is the this is actually the the size of a6 uh here in um metric countries <laughs> Or you know, four up on an A4, right? which is probably just the easiest way. So you just get a get a thing of cardstock and you run it through your printer. And this is totally free, by the way. Um, yeah, I, okay. Emily just <laughs> mentioned it's a, a might be a merch idea. Okay, it's very cool, but maybe people could like support it by like just becoming like a you know like a two dollar member or something like that would be would be payment enough for me. Um, but you know what, what I thought was cool about this idea, if I do say so myself is like, here, we've got a C and then I mentioned on the other side, not only like what the identity the light is a little funky, well, not only what the identity of the card is, but like where it appears on the piano keyboard and also like any particular stuff, it's a little blurry there, but I notice I note that it's the pitch of the viola's fourth string, right? So the lowest string. And then I also like as the cards get higher, I mentioned like, you know, that like, for instance, 
like the um, this G is the is probably a, right around the highest note of primo passaggio for the contralto alto uh, contralto vocal range. So it's just you know it's the it would be about the highest pitch of ch of chest voice before they would have to cross over into chest voice. Um. So, or crossover from chest voice into, into a mixed range. So anyway, um, it's, I mean, I will be in, uh, I will be including that in, um, <laughs> I'm actually about to release a chapter on, uh, on contralto reading, but let me jump back to these, um, these posts. So that's just the first post. And then the next post talks about scoring. It's, you can see it's like a it's just like a little course that you could take, right? So like I supply some uh, some blank sheets of staff paper, just the completely blank does not have any uh, any stuff on it. And then I invite you to do some exercises like write out your own alto clefts like this, for instance, you know, excuse me, like um, wait, like this. Right. There's a bunch of different, you know, like you slowly get better at it. Um, there are two different methods. There's like the 13 and then there's the K. <laughs> right, this is K and then with a flat on the B space. Right. So, um, yeah. And, and here I have some examples, some historical examples. Um, you notice that uh, that Beethoven has this beautiful, you know, I mean, that is just some beautiful calligraphy. Then Bartok looks sort of like Mickey Mouse ears. <laughs> and Mozart has like a little scribble. Or a squiggle and Copeland, I think it's beautiful. It looks like a seagull, right? But it's kind of going towards the K idea. So you sort of see that with Copeland and you see that with Clinton Romer. And um, this is a copyist from Salabert Editions. Uh, and then here um, is Bernard Hermann. You can see the sort of like almost like a letter B. And I really love this from Debussy, right? So it's it's sort of like the Beethoven idea that beautiful, like this two arcs. Uh, almost like the the astrological sign Pisces, right? But like sort of stripped over towards the side with the two dots in the middle. Right? So, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. But, you know, look, people are going to be able to read this, right? Is the 13 or the or the K, right? And I found myself like just gravitating towards the K because I was on a huge role in this one project. But, you know, recently when I've been doing handwriting, hand copying, I've been kind of gravitating back towards the 13, you know, um, then uh, then I've got like a little subsection here I showed before, and that is learning to write key signatures on alto clef. It's just everything is like one step lower, right? It's like one step higher than bass clef, one step lower than treble clef. Um, you just... You know, you, you start with a, the F space, not the F line, right? And then you add the C sharp on the C line, right? And then you add the G sharp on the G sharp on the, excuse me, on the G line. And then there's, you know, the same thing for, um, so like you get the practice of doing key signatures. Then what I've got here is I've got some, <clears throat> I've got some drills for you, basically like copying out some different parts from viola, alto trombone, alto choir. Um, and you just would copy all that out, um, but in alto clef, right? And, um, you know, then I also have some things in some lower range uh, viola scoring um, in, in bass clef. And then also that is something for you to copy out in alto clef. And then here I've got like, you know, kind of mixed, right? Grand staff scoring. And, you know, here's a really cool Bartok thing going on here where he's got like one low open C and then he's got this stuff ro running up and down uh, on the G string. And then of course, like this, this really wild Ravel um, thing. So anyways, and then I've got the keys for all of those. Once you, once you have done your exercise, you can um, download the key. Alrighty, um, and then this is pretty cool. Like I talk about the actual score reading of the instruments, where they're at. Um, you know, some basic ground rules about alto clef in general. You know, maybe usually only viola changes clef unless you had to have some really like wild alto trombone scoring with fundamentals in it or something. Um, yeah, and then just like there are some there are some similarities between. 
uh, between the instruments, you know, treble clef changes only needed for viola and so on. Um, and then I talk specifically about the viola and, you know, about like where the transition to the treble clef might occur and why. Then I've got a score study for um, the Brandenburg Concerto number no. six uh, with an IMSLP post and a video with score plus audio and so on. Um, you know, and just a few tips about reading it. Okay. And then I've also released one on alto trombone. Um, yeah. Introduction to alto trombone, just like kind of the, and I talk about the, the basic registers of the older style instruments, you know, the alto, the tenor and the bass, you know, sometimes you might see tenor parts from the classical era written in bass clef, like that, um, um, Berlioz does that. All right. And just, you know, um, how the alto trombone could like uh, sort of sneak in there or the trombones could sneak in there and play pitches. Um, here you sort of see in the kind of darker red um, that were out of range for the um, for natural horns and trumpets and so on. And then some tips on score reading that. And um, yeah, and just, you know, where where you'll usually see most of the writing for also trombone is just really from, you know, this low G all the way up to, you know, I guess, you know, I mean, it just depends, like, you know, it could be all the way up to F, maybe E's probably, or E flat is probably like a better, um, like you got a high F in um, Beethoven five, but it's like rarely asked for by anybody else. Um, you know, and then like, once again, a score study, this time I've actually got a link to a video that I made um, and that that I have not yet released publicly, uh, but I will soon uh, when I move a lot of this over to the um, to the uh, to the regular orchestration online site, which I'll do in a few months. Um, yeah, so. So, yeah, like, you know, that's then I'm going to have. um this is this is going to be followed up by a um, a, uh, <clears throat> um, a last chapter on contralto um, uh, contralto vocal score you know score study and I've got some uh, I've got some really really great excerpts from Kathleen Ferrier I, I believe she's like one of the greatest contraltos who ever lived she just was and she was like hilariously funny um and smart and and um just had the had just like the perfect artistic attitude and you know people called her sort of like the um you know like like rather than the uncommon virtuoso they've called her like the common virtuoso or the common diva or something like that and i think that's not that it's not really the right way to put it i think she was like a kind of like an every every woman kind of virtuoso right she like she was really down to earth and and at the same time i didn't stop her from being incredibly intelligent and and uh and just like one of the greatest artists of all time just fantastic so anyway so that's going to be coming up in in a um in a week or two um probably before christmas and then just like also coming this month are going to be tenor clef studies, right? But like, I want you all, if you, if you want to, if you want to study this, okay, if you want to study my alto clef stuff and the tenor clef stuff, do the alto clef stuff first and really, really learn it. Get it to the point where you just like, you look at an alto clef, uh, you an, an alto staff scoring a bit of scoring and you just immediately understand exactly what the notes are to the point where like if you have some um if you have some audiation skills like you can sort of hear the music inside that it just that triggers it or you could just easily sit down and, and like sight read it or maybe sight sing it right um that would actually be the next test like if i if i could work this into an audiation course somehow then i would be you know asking you guys to, to audiate it so anyway um, <clears throat> one last little thing here, and, you know, this is just for, just to kind of keep this watch, uh, watchable in for future generations when I'm hopefully in, uh, <clears throat> you know, kind of in a better frame of mind. Uh, and that is like right now, you know, I've got my honey, lemon and ginger right here. 
And I've also got a thermos. I made a thermos of a second dose. <laughs> and uh, that'll probably get me through, you know, 90 minutes, how, uh, two hours or whatever, how long, ever long this is going to go. But if I suddenly feel the need to blow my nose, choke, hack, gasp, or whatever, I will go to this screen and um, mute. I'm going to mute uh, my uh, audio, if you don't mind. While I hack, gasp, blow my nose, um, do whatever I possibly can <clears throat> to, um, to get the phlegm out of my throat, out of my face. All right? So those are the ground rules <laughs> for this Q&A session. Okay, so I haven't had any questions, many questions yet. There's there are a few here at the beginning from Andrew. Um, let me just really I'm gonna go back to the top here, make sure I didn't miss any. Okay, all right. So before I get into this, I'm, I want to answer one from my email. Okay, you just give me um, indulge me for a second because I actually have this set up on my other screen. Um. Uh, open my email. Okay, so I got a question from, okay, it says uh, Martin Rondell says, um, hello, what book do you recommend for mainly wood, wind instrument orchestration? I'm a self-taught wind band composer and want to learn more. Uh, greetings, Martin. Okay, all right, so I've got two suggestions, <laughs> one of which is completely self-serving. <laughs> Okay, and um, and that is, let's see, um, let's, hang on, let me shift over. Uh, one of which is, complete. let's start with the self-serving one. All right, and that is uh, right here. I've got a course on orchestration, the wind section over on Mac Pro Video. It's got um, New Zealand Symphony Orchestra playing the, playing the um, audio excerpts and so on and and members of the orchestra playing uh, demos. So that's you know that's one way to sort of get into the kind of uh, you know kind of get get close up close and personal with the different instruments. And then um, I think possibly you know much more useful and in-depth would be Brett Newton's um, series on band orchestration. Uh, his uh, book on woodwinds is, you know, pretty much what I think Martin is asking for. Notice that he's got he's got things arranged similar to me. Uh, I think he adds recorders and sarusophones and, you know, miscellaneous woodwinds and so on. And that's all cool. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, he's, of course, he's got like, you know, Martin is interested in like like scoring for band and so on. So here's a really great book on that band orchestration. And then when he's ready to move up to brass, there's a book on that too. Um, and I, of course, am possibly going to be making some, uh, making some brass courses for, uh, if I can get my health back together, <laughs> uh, making some brass courses over the next year or two for, um, for Mac Pro Video or possibly in conjunction with another organization, which I'm still started starting to develop that idea. Here we got Symphony 2 um, by Brett. His scoring is just excellent. So, I mean, just worth it just to read his his beautiful scoring. Um, he really is a phenomenal composer. You know, it's just one of those things where like, it, it, you know, sorry, my phone just dinged. That's telling me, hey, you've got, I, you know, I reported that I had COVID. So it actually here in, New Zealand, it tells you, hey, you've got COVID. It's very helpful. Anyway, um, all right, so let's get back to the Q&A. All right. So uh, Andrew has got... Um, okay, a question. He says, he asks, um, two questions arrange in order of decreasing importance. Great. Number one, in your fantastic book, thank you, <laughs> 100 more orchestration tips. You mentioned a safely sized orchestra that has eight winds, 10 brasses. Was it 10 or was it nine? I can't remember. Anyways. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 10. One timpanist, two percussionists, and strings. If I had four winds, a third trumpet, 
and a third percussionist, but reduce the size of the string section, how are the risks increased if they are? Okay, so hang on a second. I'm just checking my fuzzy brain here for a second. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's four horns, two trumpets, three trombones, and a tuba, right? So that's that's 10 brass. So you're saying like if I, you know, if you have 11 brass and 12 winds and okay so what are the risks how are the risks increase if they are well i mean it just all it means is that like you are going to have to work with a medium-sized orchestra right so so like like a safely sized orchestra is just like you know what you could compose and and just be assured that like whatever orchestra you send it to could could conceivably play it right that's it's like a safety thing, right? So, so if you're gonna go up to, sorry, this hair is bothering me. If you're going to go up to like a full orchestra, then um, you know, which would I would say triple. That's triple winds, um, you know, tr uh, triple heavy brass, or you know, if not including tubas, um, and and so on. You know, uh, three three percussionist and a timpanist, um, and so on. Um, then, then, yeah, I mean, that's like the medium sized orchestra. No, they wouldn't be reducing their strings for that, right? It just would be the, you know, normal sized, you know, medium orchestra. And, and a lot of the major orchestras have a basic size um, of that. And that's that because that's most of the scoring that they do, right? <clears throat> so, for, for instance, I think New Zealand Symphony Orchestra might have, I think they have that, but they have, um, they might only have two contract players on flute. Actually, I don't know, I'd have to go check, but I, I know that they've got at least three, um, three on clarinet, right? So, I mean, a lot of times they, they sub out to players who are just always available, right? You know, it's like they're, they don't have anything else going on in their life, but to play third, right? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's safe if you, if you know, you're going to be working with that size orchestra, right? So you're thinking like, I would say that would be like, um, like a, a semi-pro orchestra with a really good budget, you know, or maybe a university orchestra, you know, with a from a university or conservatory that has got a lot of players. But that's both of those options are kind of unlikely these days. Um, so I would say like a city orchestra or regional orchestra and up, right? So um, all right, so. Second question from Andrew, if in a tutti, an important line in the winds is being drowned out, will adding a piccolo in its high register making make it audible? No, no, it'll just make the piccolo audible, right? The piccolo is not going to have a, like a stochastic resonance kind of, um, you know, it's like it's, its existence is not going to pull the, the, the resonance of the, of the other winds upwards into the sound picture. You just really do have to balance everything. You know, you know, I mean, it just depends on what you, what you want. Right. You know, I mean, and you know, the piccolo is going to get sucked up too by the resonance of what's below it. If every, if the octave is really strong until it gets above like a B C. Right. And even up to C, I would say, but like once you get in, get up to D E F G and so on above the staff, then yeah, the piccolo will just really shine forward and and uh, really dominate. All right, Roque suggests as a merch idea a clef mug. <laughs> that would be great. Actually, what if what if I had like? Let's jump back to um. Uh, what if I had? Uh, a clef mug that had a version of this on it. Hang on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sort of a, kind of somewhat condensed. <laughs> right. Uh, that might be a good, you know, like this could be one side of the mug and then this could be the other side of the mug. Anyway, as a, as a kind of a, uh, <clears throat> kind of, kind of a reminder. Okay. All right. So back to the Q and a, you guys are being so awesome. I, I really appreciate how patient everybody's being as I'm getting through all of this. Just like, you know, you guys are my friends out there and, and my colleagues. And I really, 
you know, we're all on this road together. And I really do appreciate the, you know, just the way that we're all working to make this all possible. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, so, uh, Emily mentions she, she thinks she's seen Cor Anglais written at concert pitch in alto clef and some Russian orchestra scores. And somebody mentions, oh, and then she mentions later on, or it's Ryan pops in and talks about alto clef from Prokofiev, alto clef in C. Yeah. I mean, Samuel Barber, right? Yeah. So, but like, don't do that today. That's all I can say, right? Just, just, you know, observe the standard notation forms for that because those are sort of special cases. You know, it's like the early 20th century, people were changing a lot of things and they kind of didn't know what was going to be possible and what was going to be preferred by the players. And a lot of times the players were following the conductors and sort of adjusting and so on and so forth. And um, but, you know, you know, like no, no player ever really agreed to read alto clef, right? you know, except for, you know, unless you're a violist and something that I'm going to be mentioning in my, um, in my contralto, um, my contralto, uh, vocal reading is that like the use of the alto clef for vocalists, um, is something that was already being abandoned in the, uh, in the late Baroque, right? So, um, if you if you check out the um, the original score for some of Handel's um, uh, parts that were intended for you know for contralto, um, like they they're obviously you know they're they're written in treble clef. He doesn't bother with the alto clef. But like you look at Bach, um, you know his his scores his alto choir parts and his contralto solo parts are both in alto clef. And the, um, um, and like Mozart works, you know, and, you know, Mozart's published works like his, his alto and contralto parts are also an alto clef and so are Beethoven's and so on. But then like you kind of go forwards into just a little ways into the early romantic and you just notice just how fast publishers and composers are just ditching the alto clef. So that by the time you get to Brahms's Alto Rhapsody, you know, it's all written in treble clef, right? His Ein Deutsches Requiem, right? That is, you know, you check that out, you find an alto clef in there, right? <laughs> Except for maybe some strange edition, but like, it's like everything's in treble clef. So, which is sad because like, you know, Kathleen Ferrier has got this incredible version of the Alto Rhapsody which I think would have made like the greatest score study for you guys. But like, you know, but like what, what would, I would have to, I would have to do something kind of slightly dishonest, which would be, I'd have to score out the excerpts I wanted you to read in alto clef. So you could get the practice of reading in alto clef, a part that was never written in alto clef. And that's just seems to me to be silly, right? I think you should learn to like, like the contralto, a vocal study is last because it's like the least of least in importance. Right. And then the alto trombone, alto trombone is second because it's sort of secondary in importance. And then the viola scoring is first because that's absolutely, absolutely primary. You just have got to understand that. All right. So let's go back to our questions. All right. Emily mentions Brett Newton has got good wind band orchestration resources. In fact, he used to have a, uh, a website called Bandistration, and uh, they had all these cool articles on it, just amazing. But like he just, I, I don't know, I think he lost interest, or his situation changed, or his, you know, his ability to work on the site changed, and so on. So, but I mean, it was wow, it was great while it lasted. Um, all right, Julianne uh, has got a question. Uh, hi, Thomas, for the score reading that you recommend so highly, what techniques can you recommend for taking notes that you can refer to later? Uh, so you mean like sort of like you're score reading a piece and like, I, well, I mean, there are, there might be, um, is there a version like a score reading app where you can kind of make notes on the side or something? I would say just, you know, just kind of knowing where you are in the score, you could always like just write down, like if you're watching, let's say you're watching a video that is like, um, like the the video has got um, bar numbers, you know, and the like. It's like it's 
the video is an image of a score with with you know the voice behind it then then just like take a note of like write down what the number of the score is and like and you know so for something to check later or or maybe just like if you feel like you didn't read it well enough then you could just like say or you could also do time track information right so like just say like you know that's actually easier because um that way you can just jump back to the time track and just like say okay i'm going to go over this page again and again until i just really feel that like i see that top line that's a g and i go all the way up to a high f and bloody blah, blah, blah you know all right um any tips for voicing chords with nine to twelfth nine to twelve different pitches in them um i i mean it, it really just depends charles oh, this is from charles gaspel Um, it depends on what kind of sound you want, right? So, um, okay. So like, you know, I mean, it, it'd be rare that you would get like anything above like a 13th chord, right? Because like you just keep adding pitches and you eventually end up back at the octave, right? It's like you get up to, um, you get up to like, you know, 15, right? So, and that's like, that it would be two octaves. So, um, but if you are saying, um, if, if what you really mean is, um, hang on a second, you guys, um, I'm just, I got a, I got to take a quick break. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So like the reason, and the reason why I am talking about like a 13th chord is that you're saying, um, voicing chords with nine to 12 different pitches in them. Right. So like, you know, if we're just talking about like diatonic chords, right. Um, you know, that's one thing. Right. But then like, if you, if you, you know, if you have every chromatic pitch in your voicing, I would say it just depends on like the the color. Like it's like we're this is an orchestration channel, right? Not a not a harmony channel. So I mean, there are different different bits of advice you'll get depending on if we're talking to a harmonist or a melodist or you know contrapuntist. But in terms of orchestration, um, what I would say is like the the lower part of the chord, to a certain extent, has got to define the upper part of the chord, and that's true if you've got three pitches or if you've got you know 12 pitches right so um you've got to build your chord carefully and you've got to choose the color the lower color right like whether it's strings or winds or combination of you know brass and you know percussion or who knows what um it's got to and you also have to think about like the duration of the chord too right so all of these things like build up the sound oops the sound picture, right? So, so, you know, that would be, you know, um, and then like, it also depends on the scope of the chord, right? You know, if you want something like a tone cluster or whether or not you want a big, beautiful expanse, I tend towards the more atmospheric, the more expansive, the more, um, um, you know, the, the like landscape building chords, right? I'm into big landscapes. All right. So, so I mean, I, 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 that's pathetic, Charles. I wish I could, <laughs> wish I could say more on it. Um, but yeah, like without context, without more context or something, I mean, it would be that it's like actually a great idea for a video, you know, um, picking really complex chords and, and seeing how different composers, you know, there's some, some fantastic chords with massive, you know, like m just wonderfully built harmonies, like from, you know, from the Rite of Spring and from Daphnis and Chloe and um, from uh, like 
Schoenberg's uh, five pieces for orchestra and so on. And I've done videos on all of those, but I haven't really analyzed the harmony or anything. But I've talked to a little bit about the um, like the the way that chords were voiced and like what the consequences for the um, tonal picture was. So with that lame <laughs> kind of explanation, let's move on to the next question. Okay, uh, ransom is a crime. <clears throat> Somebody named Ransom. Okay, Ransom. Question of preference. Do you write in concert pitch or transpose? Okay, well, Ransom, I <clears throat> always write in concert pitch. Okay, and that's because I've trained myself to read concert pitch. <clears throat> and it doesn't take a whole lot. It's just like it's sort of like riding a bicycle or something. It's it's just just sort of training yourself to feel like where the you know where the writing is opposed is opposed to the um, to the the sounding pitches, right? Yeah, you, know, you know, it's just it's just another level of training. And if it's not something that fits you, there's no there is absolutely no dishonor in that. Like, I, I mean, I've seen I've I've had videos where I talked about how you know, um. Like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a C score, right? Um, that's usually how film scores are written. And there are a lot of contemporary music scores that are written in C. And that's fine. Okay. And it is fine if you don't learn to ever transpose when you write or, or whatever. But what is not fine is to try to impose a system of non-transposition onto um, wind players and to act mockingly towards their need to transpose all that does is just you know it betrays a certain a certain arrogance if you'll pardon my observation and a, a certain um misunderstanding about the purpose of a staff for a woodwind player right so with for a woodwind player the um they have a series of fingerings and overblowing and and all this other stuff, and that's all outlined on the staff. And anytime they change model of instrument from like the standard model, which might be in C, like if you're playing oboe or flute, to a transposing model, uh, which might be in a different key or might be up an octave or whatever, or down an octave, then it's really important for them to stay, to keep that same sense of you know the the landscape of the of the of the treble staff has to stay the same so that they just that automatically their fingers work beautifully so just imagine just taking that away from them and forcing them to you know to <clears throat> every auxiliary that they pick up has to have a completely different reading system or a different relationship of fingerings to to the staff i mean it's just you know you don't know what you're asking all right so that's so that's you know that is the only thing i have a problem with is when people get an attitude about it because like the thing is is like nobody is saying that you have to score transposed there's nothing you know like why have the attitude about it i'm not saying you uh, ransom i'm just saying you know why why get these you know nasty comments about like you know oh well you know they should learn to um you know keep catch up with the 21st century and i was like can you play a wind instrument bro you know, anyway, so that's, that's my feelings about it. All right. Um, Juan Jose Aguirre says, hello, Thomas. What do you think about the practice of reducing orchestral scores versus orchestrating piano music? I've noticed that the other way around also brings me a big understanding of translation. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like in terms of just like boiling everything down, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it can... It's a, it's kind of like a, like the, the reduction, right? Which is not necessarily the piano score, but like, you know, when, when people put all the brass on one staff and all the winds on one or two staves and or whatever, you know, like, yeah. Um, then, then, yeah, I mean, that's, and that's also a really great way to score, right? Which is in C, right? Um, to kind of go back to Ransom's question. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, it, 
it tends to clarify things and it's really similar like what you read out in that diagram is sort of similar to the way that I organize all the information in my head as well, as I'm just looking at the page. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Florian asks, hi, Thomas. My question is, how would you orchestrate an SATB chorale for a string orchestra? Well, I mean, you know, soprano, also tenor, bass, right? Um, probably, you know, soprano and alto, like alto parts rarely go so low that they have to be played by viola. So a lot of tenor parts could be scored to viola, right? So you have your soprano and alto and first and second violins, tenor possibly in viola. I mean, tenor parts rarely go low enough, like they rarely go below the low C, right? And then for the bass, you have your cello part, and then you double that at the octave um, by the um, the double bass when you feel you need the weight, right? So that's like that would be like the easiest, most work a day way of doing it. But um, you know, hopefully your SATB chorale might have six voices, or you know, they might might have places where some of the parts split. Okay. All right. Um, Frano asks, um, hi, I'd just like to know if the approach for horns when scoring, is it possible on big band trumpets or trombones? I'm not sure what you mean, Frano. The approach for horns when scoring. Hmm. I mean, do you mean concert horns, like French horns, as people call them sometimes? <clears throat> and then big band trumpets or trombones. Or, or, or do you mean like, like jazz horn scoring? Is it possible to take sort of jazz horn scoring with the high notes and stuff and put that onto an orchestra? So I would say don't do that, right? Um I've actually scored parts for, you know, like E flat trumpet and stuff and then showed up at the gig and seen like this, the, you know, somebody play it on a C or even a B flat trumpet and just, you know, pop out notes above a, you know, above a written D, you know, or written E flat or whatever. Um, you know, it just depends on the, on the lip of the player and how much, you know, what, what instrument they want to play. Um, okay. Oh, Florian uh, follows up. The approach I tried was not satisfied was soprano on violin one, soprano plus alto on violins two, alto and tenor on violas, tenor. I mean, I don't know why you were not satisfied with it. I would have need a little bit more context as to why it failed. Um, all right, hang on a second. It's funny, you know, it's like <laughs> when I went there to clear my throat, um, I just imagined like, you know, YouTube's um, YouTube will generate a thumbnail for this video and it'll like <laughs> it'll like if you use an image that like is repeated a lot, it just focuses on that. So like that's going to end up being the image for this <laughs> for this video. We hate it forever. All right. Um yeah, so um, Florian, if you're still there, just like tell me why it didn't work, and then I'll follow up on your question when I get down to it. All right. Aha, cheat cheat mug. Emily says, yeah, def definitely. All right, Johannes says I'm writing a double concerto for harp and cello, symphony orchestra. Congratulations, that's awesome. What are your thoughts, tips, do's and don'ts? Any repertoire recommendations? Well, I mean, you know, find a double concerto for harp and cello. I mean, there's a isn't like, I think there are some flute and harp concertos. Well, harp and cello concerto. See, I'm trying, really trying to think. Okay, so, so first of all, <clears throat> you have your two, um, your two solo instruments, right? So that is, you need to start from that basis, right? They are going to be making um, 
a lot of the thematic statements. They are going to be carrying the character of the music and they are going to be duetting with each other, right? So, I mean, the obvious thing that comes to mind is, you know, the harp sort of accompanying the cello and so on. Maybe the cello could be playing like figuration while the harp plays big rolling chords and, you know, octave melodies and stuff. Um, the big thing that I would say is don't make your harp writing, you know, pianistic, right? Just absolutely avoid that in, in, uh, harp scoring, which sort of reminds me of like, uh, working on my harp concerto, you know, for like, oh, months and months and months and just like really trying to make it not pianistic. And, um, and, you know, working with my soloist and she didn't, you know, she was really happy with it and so on. And then like her teacher came to one of the rehearsals and he was like the guy from San Francisco symphony. Right. And I, I love that guy. He's, he's, he's really cool. And he, was, and he said, Oh, what a great concerto, Thomas. I uh, really enjoyed, you know, helping, you know, the soloist work on it. You know, I'm oh, just, you know, it's a really great pianistic writer. I was like, pianistic, what are you talking about? I spent months making it not pianistic. And I think that he got it confused with something else. Right. Anyways. So yes, don't be pianistic. All right. And also don't make the cello part turn into like a bunch of left-hand piano score writing. Right. Just really get into the soul of that instrument. Right. So, um, so like ha have the two players work together and also have the two players work together in ways that are unexpected. Okay. Like, you know, you've got harmonics, both instruments can do harmonics and then they could work together. You could have, you know, low, like a, a low harp scoring and high cello writing, you know, um, and, um, and then you have to build the orchestra around it really carefully. I would say have a reduced orchestra. Um, like there's, there's like zero need for heavy brass. I think like maybe you could have like tuba as the base to a quartet of horns. That was what I, uh, I scored for my harp concerto was, um, I had like, I originally intended it to be like a euphonium. And then <clears throat> my, um, my soloist asked me to change that part to like, or she, she requested a bass trombone part because she had a friend in, in the orchestra that she you know, that this was commissioned for who played bass trombone and who's become a friend of mine. Um, and I know in the group and so on. Um, and so I, I scored that, but like, I just like, I kept thinking, Oh, you know, like he did a great job, but like, I just feel like euphonium would work really great as a base to the, um, but I have to say, you know, it has been performed since people have always just pulled out their tubas. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, that's one thing. And then I would say just like, you know, just really go easy on the winds. Like winds can soak up the, the the tone, the color of the harp and the tone of the cello. When you want, really want the solo passages to work, um, just try to score them lightly. And, you know, when you have, when you're going towards a, a crescendo with the whole orchestra and the soloist, just have the, have the orchestra really slowly sneak up on the, on the, crescendo as opposed to everybody just going crazy all at once right because you're never gonna you're just gonna kill the harp and the cello part so i mean those are a few basics i'd have to look at the score other than that a clef mug would have a black handle and two dots for a bass clef <laughs> okay i think i've seen that um in fact I've got something like that here this was a present to me um yeah, so here you've got the uh, the F clef, but it doesn't have the two dots. It does have the um, the uh, piano keys. I you know I got tons of little musical gugas from uh, from students over the years. Yeah, I mean that's what like there are whole catalogs of things like that. Um, uh, Denny. Ask the question, good evening. I have recently been revisiting the MOOC Term 1 videos. I consider it to be a shame you didn't continue that series. Would it be possible in the future to do a shorter continuation? I mean, yeah, I mean, I I want to proceed to the string orchestra version of that and then do, you know, individual wind instruments and then 
wind ensemble or like not wind ensemble, but small orchestra, you know, like what I was mentioning at the beginning, right. Which was like, you know, doubled winds, you know, and, and a couple of horns and so on. Just like, just like kind of understanding how to score for like the basic small orchestra, which I think is just really important. You know, there's a lot of, that's where a lot of gigs are. Um, you know, people want to break into it with grandiose scoring. And I, I sympathize. That's where my head was at when I was 16 years old. I wanted to write massive works, just like, you know, what I, what I was score reading myself. But, um, but, you know, the truth is there are a lot of gigs with, for pocket orchestras and small orchestras and, you know, little, you know, th those are the people who want and are much more likely to play, you know, new music and to commission you are like semi-pro orchestras, right? You've got like, you know, maybe six or seven wind players, right? And three horn players and, and one timpanist and one percussionist who's working on their, you know, on their, um, their medical degree or something or their, their real estate license. And they don't have time to, to practice your part. Right. You know I mean? It, like you don't know, like, so like a lot of times, like kind of, kind of have to keep your expectations low key at first, but then, you know, you coax it out and you get the gig and you build on that and somebody hears about it. And then, you know, there's somebody else, you know, some conductor friend comes to see their friend's thing. And then they talk to you at the interval. And I mean, it just sort of builds. I mean, I'm not saying that schmoozing is the strategy, but it's just, you know, just there's a, everything is a big ladder and a big, you know, it's a big stairway, right? Um, jumping up to the fifth step or to the 11th step at the beginning is great. But then like, you know, you miss all the beauty of the steps on the way there. There's so much fun, you know, like, like composing when there's no consequences. Right. All right. Um, Daniel Reeves asks, hi, Daniel. Hi, Thomas. In another video, you commented that the bass clarinet can help resolve issues with overtones in the wind section. Have I understood that correctly? If so, how should we approach? Okay. So yeah. So, right. <clears throat> um, so here's the thing. Um, Since bass clarinets, um, you know, it's not only that clarinet family instruments uh, overblow only on odd numbered partials, it also means that their overtones are only odd numbered partials. Okay. So, what that means is like all the even numbered partials are erased. So, um, so what are the even numbered partials? Right. So it's like if you think of the harmonic series. So the second partial is the octave above the fundamental. Right. And then, yeah. And then like then the fourth partial is the is like the two octaves above and so on. And then the sixth partial is the uh, is the fifth above that. Right. So a lot of the consonant, um, you know, a lot of the kind of heavy consonants is taken out. Right. They're just like the all that weight sort of in the middle. And then like what that means is that like you can have a low tone that doesn't clust clutter up the middle of a um of like a, a very delicate woodwind kind of a thing, or you know, or like or you can just get it to really stick out too, right? Like if you have bass clarinet under like a beautiful string chorale or something like that then the bass clarinet really sticks out because it's not, it's not blending, right? If it, it might like say where a bassoon might blend in beautifully, the bassoon, the bass clarinet will stick out because it's not, it doesn't have any overtones to, to um, resonate with what, what's going on with the rest of the strings. All right. So there's those, that's just an example. Okay. Juan Jose Aguirre. Hello, Juan. Um, Thomas, do you believe a high string multiple divisi rhythmically aleatoric pizzicato could successfully evoke raindrops? Are there any downsides? Um, I mean, I mean, it just depends. Like, I mean, if this is like a sort of a concert sort of a situation, then I mean, you could you could try it out. You know, I mean, there are some things in like Alan Hovannis might have tried something like this. I mean, it really does sound like a Hovannis or, um, but I'm, I'm saying if you're going to be in the studio anyway, this really sounds more like a kind of a studio sort of a thing. 
and you could just check chuck some delay on it like and then you really get some raindrops right you know, you know i mean i mean i just don't know what what level of player that you'd be working with right just yeah because a lot of times like the players can be brilliant at interpreting your work but they they might just not have much of a you know the, you know they might be a little timid at first right and so you might have to try it a few times and then like it might sound great in rehearsal and then just whatever the the rhythm of everybody lines up and it's no longer random raindrops right i mean you might be better off with like a rain stick right if you want to simulate rain um you know or you might you, you maybe maybe having like really soft um a combination of really soft pizzicato um and um soft mallets on uh on vibraphone and um and glockenspiel and and then like um and harp and so on and then just like score them parts that are like slightly randomized but like definitely score you know scored out but like they're in comparison to each other you know they feel random and then then you get that sort of raindrop effect maybe okay so julian clarifies there are a lot of recommendations for how to take notes as you read books okay my question was how do you what to do if you remember if you're not systematic about it oh, oh me personally um <laughs> okay that's the thing is like the curse of the brain fog is that like I'm not systematic about it. I mean, you're right about that, but the system, I mean, I am systematic, systematic, right? But the system that I use is, is my, you know, the random access and hyper focus, right? Both of which are just in the toilet right now. Um, all right. So yeah, sorry about that, Julianne. Um, Juan asks, uh, and related to the previous question, do you know of any more interesting ways that raindrop, because oh, I just like, I think I mentioned some. All right. Um, Alex Christodoulos um, points out, copying all, all observations in Sibelius, and I have a file per observation. I mean, I will say one thing that, like, you know, um, Sibelius has some really great markup options, right? And I'm sure the, the other applications do, too, um, you know, the other professional level ones. And um, yeah, like like when I am coaching somebody for a professional performance or recording session or whatever, I'll like, you know, I will definitely leave comments all over the score as I go through. And then when we have the coaching session, I'll just talk over each one. That's just so much better way, you know. Um, but like if somebody sends me a score and it's not Sibelius, then I'll I'll just like make a list <laughs> per uh, bar number and part. All right. Any thoughts on balancing chorus and heavy brass? Asks Emily. Okay. So, all right. So it depends. Something that you'll find in like Lily Boulanger scores is that she underpowers the um, like like in terms of the dynamic. On um, she underpowers the choir compared to the brass. She is expecting that the choir is going to be way louder than the brass. Right. So like she might have something marked fortissimo for the trombones and like forte for the tenors and basses. Yeah. I mean, I think that she was dealing with like, you know, hundred voice choruses, you know, like choirs, I should say. She was expecting enormous amounts of, of vocal resources. So it just really depends on how many singers do you think are going to be involved. Really? That that's part of it. Because like the, you know, and then it's up to the choir master too, right? So like part of this question is really, you know, like what is the conductor going to do? What's the hall going to be like? All of these things, you know, like people think that dynamics are like a, a settled science, right? Or that like they're absolute, that like they're, you know, it's almost like, a, you know, like dials on a, uh, on a mixer, on a sound mixer, um, when I said mixer, my random excess brain immediately thought of an osterizer of a, of like a blender. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so what, what I would say, Emily is mark everything the same dynamic, 
All right. So that's that's A. Um, B, um, trust the trust the conductor to, you know, to work out the proportions. They'll bring down the they'll bring down the heavy brass. Right. But what I would say is like, don't do anything that involves low heavy brass going a different direction loudly from the um the bases and the tenors okay because that is just going to screw them up right they they need to either be in conjunction with one another or to not get in a, get in on each other's turf okay because it's just really hard on the brains of us baritones <laughs> okay us bass singers i okay this is funny like i once sang a just a slight um detour here i once uh presented a one of my concerts uh of like pirate um i did a uh, i wrote like a um um uh, like a one of these uh baby pops concerts um and i did the presenting as a pirate and i wrote everything in like the uh lower bass baritone register and wow it was just great to sing down there it was gravelly wow but it, you know it is really uses your voice up um, so it's kind of almost easier to imitate Robert Plant, you know, than it is to imitate Mephistopheles. All right. So, um, all right. So, um, so Emily is, uh, uh other Emily <laughs> is asking, um, whether I write transposed. Yeah, I write transposed. Yeah. Yeah, I write, write transposed and I think transposed and I understand the transposition and the meaning and it's all just one big thing. Okay, concert pitch means C score, yeah. yeah. So like, you know, art concert score, C, co C scores, yes. Did I, oh, did I say something wrong? Transposed, I probably just said, look, I got, I'm a, I'm a sick man. <laughs> don't, don't, you know, always, you know, with this particular Q and A session, just you know, you know, just assume that I'll have more than one foot in my mouth at any given time. Perhaps, a probably COVID brain fog. <laughs> Definitely. All righty. So, um, I'm just gonna um, take a quick look at this. I had some notes which are being hidden by something else uh hang on it's on my other computer okay all right okay so all right so um I'm going to let some more um, questions accumulate, all right, and just talk about a couple of things. Okay. Um, let me. Okay. So, as I've been sitting here convalescing and um, <laughs> I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos and Few things I was not aware of, um, and one of those was the current uh, H bomber guy video on plagiarism, which basically brought down two major channels that sort of survived on plagiarism. Okay, um, you know, like basically the the situation was that um, you know that there were people, there were content farms that were basically, you know, I mean, the the purpose of the channel might have been righteous, you know, like, you know, bringing down MLMs or, or you know, exposing bad faith business and so on. But the problem was that the, um, the writing for the uh, scripts was basically just copy pasting <laughs> um, from articles that, that people had, you know, written for online journals and so on. And then turning that into content, like into video content. And, you know, this is something that I don't necessarily think there's a big problem with in my world, which is not very big, um, you know, of like online um, internet resource training for orchestrators, right? Um, 
but you know, it kind of got me thinking. You know, I saw I saw this additional thing. Um, I guess was it? Um, yeah. So there was an uh, an important uh, a performance on Saturday Night Live um, where uh, Noelle Denton basically got her, you know, like the kind of beat for beat <laughs> her video of her song was basically used for Olivia Rodrigo's performance. Right. So, uh, you know, like, so, so basically, you know, YouTube is being used as a sort of idea factory. Right. And, you know, once again, I mean, that doesn't necessarily affect my thing, but it kind of got me thinking about, you know, what would be a problem. And I feel that like the thing that we face here you know, it was like people who want to make videos, um, uh, video content and online training and stuff. What we have got to do is we have to come from a, from a, a place of authenticity. All right. So, so like, you know, you shouldn't be giving professional advice to people if you are not you know, if it's not your profession, right? Um, and, and, you know, I'm, and I'm not trying to cut anybody out of the advice game. You know, I think that like, let's say you are developing composer and something really incredible happens to you in your career, then by all means, you should share that and you should share the lessons that you learned and you should pass around the tips that, you know, that's absolutely true. But I think you have to be careful about saying, you know, all professionals do it the way that I did it here and so on. Uh, you know, I, I think you have to just be careful about taking that step. Now, you know, like a lot of my content is based on the advice that I'm getting from professionals, right? So like the more, the the higher level professional that I work with, the more serious I take their advice to an extent though, because like sometimes professionals at the highest level can be very conservative. So here's an example of that. Like, I followed this guy here, Mini Minute Man, who is Milo Rossi. Okay. And he has really funny takedowns of people saying, like, you know, there are, there's evidence of giants and aliens and, you know, and, and so on. And he's done some really cool things where he like travels around the world and he goes to archaeological sites and he talks about, you know, different things about archaeology and geology and so on. I, I really, I think he's a cool guy. Um, but like, he's been, you know, and, and he's got this, he's got this vlog thing now where he sort of, you know, he's, he's kind of made a, an actually specific journey that he is vlogging. Okay. But the thing about it is that like <laughs> an actual archeologist got a hold of his videos and, you know, released this takedown where, you know, like Milo Rossi was doing things like, you know, finding pot sherds at archaeological sites and then, you know, like stacking them so like an archaeologist could see them, you know, and, or, and you know, sort of sitting on on rocks and so on and so forth. And, you know, and, and like a lot of archaeology sort of relies on context. Right. So, I mean, and that just sort of all brings me back to Samuel Adler's knowing what you're doing right now. Like a lot of people have problems with Samuel Adler's um, uh, study of orchestration because of some, you know, some specifics in some of the instrument um, descriptions are inaccurate. And she really should have been corrected by the fourth edition. And I don't, I don't disagree with that, but I feel that like in terms of his, overall advice on the actual scoring part of it it's is usually pretty sound so um but like his overall point here which isn't really quite in this video that has gone up on youtube you know is you sort of see it coming out of this this um uh, this interview here kind of talking about like the you know the wealth of information you know and and I'm not saying that that like really comes to like a, a point where like that gives you absolute authority to say a thing and say that it's true, but like at least if we think about like the reverse, right? 
if we think about the reverse of that, like not necessarily, not necessarily, excuse me, not not necessarily saying, um, you know, I'm so smart and I'm so experienced, so my way is correct. Um, but like the reverse of it, right, which is to say, um, <clears throat> you know, this this has worked for me in a professional situation. And I can back that up from my from the experience. And I'm not saying that that is the only way to do it, but it's a useful, you know, possible workaround if you have this problem or if you run into the same situation, right? So, so like, but you've got to go through these ex those experiences, right? You can't just like find it on one of my blog posts or find it on somebody else's blog post or in a book or something like, and say this is the rule, right? So, so what I would just say is just like, like it's all down to authenticity, right? So just like really come from an authentic place and then nobody can accuse you of being on inauthentic, right? Maybe the source of the information might be questionable and you might find that out, you know, in the, ser in the course of, of like presenting your information, right? Because like, look, you know, everything that I'm, I've been saying for the past five minutes is not in any way a discouragement of anybody out there who is like kind of starting their channels. And, and I know, uh, you know, a lot of people who are going to be watching this are and so on. Um, and I've seen some really great content um, from people just starting. And I think it's a shame that they're not really getting more views. Uh, you know, I mean, I think it's a shame that I'm not getting more views. But, um, you know, just I think the more that like you, you like you really make the audience a part of that journey, the better you know, and, and the more that you are, are talking about something relatable, that's really useful and helpful, then I think, I don't think you can go wrong. Right. Cause that's how I started. <laughs> right. I'm just like, like I could see things that people were batting their head against. Seeing a lot of simple solutions that could be shared with people who needed the information. Right. So, so I think that that's, that's a really good place to start. And then of course, like the subtleties, subtleties come out as you talk about the topic and you get deeper into it and so on. Um, but like the more abstruse and the more, um, the more immortal and the more rarefied your information, the smaller the audience There's something else I've found out about, you know, in my online content. So, so anyway, so that was just a little rant I wanted to get off my chest and to, you know, to allow some of the Q&A to continue. Um, all right, so, <clears throat> all right, so um, Ransom jumps in and says, absolutely agree with it, imposing concert pitch on wins. Ha ha, I'm a win player myself. Thanks for your perspective. I'm guessing I'm used to software where you can switch between the two, which is fine. It's perfectly fine. I, I don't, I don't care if people can't transpose when they read. I mean, it's good to be able to, um, but you don't have to, okay? It's just like, it's not a big ego thing. All right, that's cool, man. That's all right. And then Julianne says, I've been leaning on the tool to transpose from the way that Thomas talks about scoring to the transposition. Sounds like it can build a deeper empathy with what the player experiences. Absolutely, absolutely. See, that is the key, right? Julianne has got it right. You know, she's completely got the, hit the nail on the head. The head on the nail, I was about to say. Um, yeah, I mean, it like, you know, if you if you can see what the written range is and how that relates to all of the all of the auxiliaries, which will have more or less the same written range, you know, minus a few extended pitches here and there. Um, yeah, you know, like you just you really see where the weight of the instrument is like it's the tessitura, right? I've been actually working on like you know, what does tessitura mean? And um, let me see if I can find this one image to share with you guys. All right. So this is a really crude, um, I'm dragging this over to my other screen. Hang on. So, right. So, all right. So check this out. Okay. Um, so this is, this is actually, I actually have a much more complete version of this image. Uh, let me see if I can enlarge it just a little bit more here. All right. So this is like the general range 
of each vocal type, right? So, you know, starting with mezzo soprano, this is middle C, right? And then uh, this, excuse me, excuse me, I said that wrong. Starting with soprano, this is middle C, right? And then right here, this is A below middle C, and then alto clef, uh, F, and so on, all the way up. And th this is, in, in each case, it's like a, a span of about two octaves, plus like some extra notes on top and bottom and so on. So like mezzo parts, like mezzo singers will sometimes, if they've got a kind of a a bigger voice, they might actually sing with the uh, with the like in a in a section with contraltos to make up an alto section. Like alto and contralto are not the same exact thing. And then here we got the tenor and so on. And, and you know, I mean, it's a it's down one step, but do you see how like the tessitura? of each of each part <clears throat> is centered around the same or more or less the same positions on the staff right and the the purpose of the c clef is to keep um is to keep them all like kind of just centered around those same those same lines and spaces right it, it's just it's a fun thing i mean it's it's like as close as you can get to um to concert pitch transposition, right? It's kind of a weird thing. Anyways, I thought that that was kind of fun, and that'll be in the in the next um, in that next chapter of my alto clef scoring, talking about vocal scoring. Just a just a kind of an aside. All righty, so let's get back to your questions. Um, concert pitch score makes analyzing chords and such easier. Um, Transposing makes communicating with a musician easier, especially in the amateur world. Okay, so Cerulean, um, I would agree with you, except for the fact that, like, I mean, concert pitch scores make analyzing the chords and such easier unless you read transposition really well, and then you just immediately see, oh, well, that's, you know, <clears throat> you know, that's a G minor seventh chord, you know, leading to a D7 flat five plus... 13 or whatever plus anyways sorry um so yeah um <laughs> all right julianne says an impressive ability to go on mute before the explosion i've not accomplished that well oh well there's been a couple of times you probably noticed that i started to fade out while i was trying to answer a, answer a question Okay, James Watson says, I'm sorry, I'm only partially following this chat conversation. Do we mean writing the score in concert pitch, but providing the parts in the natural key of the instrument? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what it is, James. It's like in a concert pitch score, a C score, um, <clears throat> like the parts are always distributed to the players in concert, excuse me, in transposed pitch in the, the you know, the just the natural scheme of their instrument, right? Um, the thing that I was talking about before was when people get an attitude and they say, well, <laughs> you know, we should all read and see, and all the players should be trained and see, you know, cause like they just, like, they're not really aware of how, you know, wind instrument training works. So, all right. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, alrighty. So, hmm. Okay, hang on. I'm gonna. There's a comment by Cerulean. I think I missed. I'm missing something. So, yeah. So Cerulean, if you can, like he had this reply. Oh, I see Florian. Florian said, "Can't say why it didn't work. I guess I would want my main melody, which is in the soprano voice, to be more in the foreground." Double the soprano voice an octave below or above. Yeah, I mean, look at just, yeah, that's the thing about choir scoring. It just really is different from, from string scoring. And now that I sort of hear that concern, maybe what you need to do is spread out the harmony more rather than like, you know, just, just completely import the voicings and everything like that. And, and then just add an octave on top. Maybe what you need to do is to, is to expand the parts, right? Because like the voicing might be like really, you know, like everything might be like four part harmony, almost like, you know, horn scoring where like everything is like just like octave chords and so on. 
or seventh chords. So maybe what you need to do is just like, you know, you might have a situation where the bass part is an octave lower, right? And then the, um, and then the alto part is lower. I don't know an octave or not. And then your tenor part is higher than the alto part. And then your soprano part is an octave higher than that, right? So that you just, you're basically, you know, you're expanding things outwards and just kind of re reorganizing the harmonic information that might not work for every chord, but, you know, but it's just a way of, um, it's a way of making things, you know, a little bit bigger. I mean, especially with strings, like people are constantly like overscoring string scoring. <clears throat> you can get away with, I mean, strings have so much natural resonance and have so much natural richness that oftentimes you just really don't, you know, you need to, you don't need to use as many voices as you think. Um, an example of this is Grieg's Holberg Suite, which is, you know, um, a lot of string ensembles find it really fun to play. But if you actually listen to, if you listen to it and you compare the, the, um, the notes to the piano score, what you'll find is that Grieg has like scored every single note in its, or pretty much in its original place compared to the piano score. And, you know, I think every once in a while he like adds an octave below, above and below and so on. And, <clears throat> you know, you end up with like you're going from four parts to six parts to seven parts and so on, just depending on how many, how many fingers he used and whether he was playing a chord or a melody or whatever. And it just, there's a certain unevenness to that. And then like when he has lots and lots of voices going on at once, it becomes almost organ like, right? So like just kind of limiting the amount of voices and just letting the richness of the instruments fill in you know, you, you get so much, I think just so much better of a sound. So those are my advice. So th thanks for filling that in Florian and, and bringing it back. Uh, right. Yeah. So I, I, I forget what I said. <laughs> Charles mentions, correct my error. Anyways, I, I, I forget what I did wrong. That's my, that's my lame excuse. All right, Cerulean mentions euphonium is a lovely instrument, though I prefer the bass trombone. Well, I mean, it just depends. Like, uh, bass trombone is great as the bass for, like, um, a uh, a heavy brass um, octet, right? So, <clears throat> which would be um, four trumpets, four trombones, right? And you just get that beautiful crisp sound. It's incredible. There's some like re there are Renaissance. Um, there's Renaissance music where you've got um, like a lot of four part harmony or four part scoring that's that's being played by like that kind of octet, right? So you've got two instruments on each part, and yeah, some of that's just incredible. Um, but like, if I want just beautiful, subtle, soft, controlled uh, brass scoring where just like the the that you know wonderful essence of horn that horn quality is carried all the way down to the root note right then then i want like an f tuba or a, a euphonium or something like that or maybe like a little um a french b flat tuba or something like that okay frano says uh thanks thomas for answering i guess i didn't make the right question what if it was the trumpets and trombones could be treated in pairs as four French horns do in a symphonic setting? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I do that all the time. I, in fact, like the um, the French used to have this, you find it in French scoring, like um, Lily Boulanger does this. And I'm sure that she was imitating composers like Franck from that sort of generation before hers, Massonet. Um, who's a way greater composer than people remember today. And, you know, part of that is just because he was, <clears throat> he became part of this, um, this generation to rebel against, right? Uh, Ducat as, a, as another composer. Okay. And, and so this, this thing that I'm, this 
this quality that I'm trying to tell you about is to have the uh, trombones as a quartet, bass trombone and then three tenors. And then they would play chords like a, like a, um, a brass pad <clears throat> really softly <laughs> behind the texture. So you might have this massive tutti going on, just bash, crash, bang, crunch. <clears throat> Everybody playing like mezzo forte, forte, and so on. Uh, fortissimo. And then like right in the background at piano, <laughs> pianissimo sometimes, you'd have the trombones just playing, like sort of outlining the harmony. And wow, does that have an incredibly, it, it just like, you know, without it, you'd notice it, but with it, you know, and that's the way I think that a lot of pads should be. Okay. Um, James Subositz, Subositz, pardon me if I mispronounce your name, asks, have you ever written for a British brass band? In fact, yeah, I, I, I was actually commissioned. Um, <clears throat> and um, I, I, I scored some stuff and um, yeah, it hasn't been performed yet, but yeah, but I, yeah, I've worked on British brass band scores and so on. Um, what did I score? I did a version of um, Streets of San Francisco. That's like one of my, you know, that is such an awesome, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome TV theme. And it's also like just like the the drum solo parts in it and so on. So scoring out the drum solo and <clears throat> it's just built for British brass band. All right. It's Noxy asks, have you thought about doing some videos or writings focusing on composing for choir with orchestra? I feel there's something often overlooked in orchestration manuals. Yeah, that was like supposed to be like the last chapter of my Mac Pro video series. <clears throat> yeah. And Charles Gaskell observed with odd number only harmonics, no notes occur an octave higher. So, yeah. Or an octave above the root, I think. Okay, and then it's Noxie suggests just use a rain stick or recorded sound effect. Uh, hi, asks Graphomaniac. My friend really loves solo and chamber pieces by, but she doesn't feel comfortable exploring orchestral repertoire. Okay, thoughts on Schubert C major quintet. Is it orchestrated in a good way? I mean, I think it's. I think that's a fantastic piece of music. I mean, I think it should be orchestrated, orchestrated, right? And I think some somebody, and I think there probably are some orchestral versions. Mm, a bunch of pieces use snapping to simulate rain only works with a bunch of people, really, says James. Uh, Andrew Q says, in large choirs, I often find that fortissimo singers and brass will balance somewhat. <clears throat> see the BBC proms performance of Verdi's Requiem. Yeah, I mean, that's fair enough. Yeah. Also in Ein Deutsches Requiem. Oh. <clears throat> <clears throat> Have there been any orchestration discoveries, tips, pieces, anything really that has changed the game for you? <clears throat> Either when you had started or more recently as an experienced orchestrator. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Mm. I mean, it's all just kind of an evolution, right? It all kind of helps me build. <clears throat> Sometimes I'll I'll hear something that like has a different perception for me. Like for instance, um <clears throat> every you know, every once in a while I'll watch like a true crime documentary. I'm gonna watch a bunch of different kinds of things. And I've noticed like, like the usually the music for a true crime documentary is just kind of endlessly reused. And it's, you know, a bunch of cliches, you know, you know, high tremolo strings and, you know, tone clusters on the piano and so on. And, um, and I was listening to this one British program and 
the composer actually did some composing and it had like some solo cello that was, you know, it wasn't a bunch of cliches strung together. It was so actually some beautiful melodic writing. And then, you know, there was some chamber music, right? And there was a, some orchestral scoring. And, you know, and I thought, wow, man, they just, they had a pretty good budget for this. Um, so, you know, like usually like what I find to be game changing would be like um, the treatment of the, um, of the material, right? Rather than necessarily like the, like one or two little tips. And, you know, or sometimes like I'll run into an instrument that I, I will, I would consider could be game changing were it only used. And that was like working with <clears throat> an experienced contraforte player. <coughs> Sorry, guys, my throat's starting to get used up. Oh, sorry, guys. <coughs> sorry. Hang on. <clears throat> okay guys uh as you probably, probably heard me stumbling around there i forgot to turn my forgot to mute my mic so yeah so my voice is giving out <clears throat> uh one last thing i wanted to talk about and that is um uh this channel here all the perks it's mainly the um, <clears throat> it's mainly uh, started by Abby Savile and uh, I think her husband Dan helped out from time to time but man she's a great percussionist and the resources of her company uh, LA percussion rentals are pretty amazing and <clears throat> You know, that, comp that company is like as much a labor of love as, you know, it is a business. <coughs> and uh, they're really in trouble right now because Dan uh, died last month. So look, <clears throat> I'm going to leave this up here. This is how we could help them out. I mean, it's just. It's just a little bit of help um, making sure that, you know, just one one aspect of their life is um, 
is taken care of, at least for a little while. And uh, <clears throat> if you feel like any kind of holiday giving, <clears throat> that's what I would recommend because um, Abby has done so much for <clears throat> the community in like dropping in on the Facebook group, giving advice to developing composers on, and some professionals too, on their percussion scoring and resources and um, logistics. You know, I mean, she's been amazing. And Dan would occasionally jump in too <coughs> with some really great practical advice. And um, yeah, man, I just, uh, you know, when Dan died, I just, I didn't know what to think because I was just getting to know him and, um, and what a righteous guy. So anyway, um, yeah, so I'm sorry that um, I, uh, I didn't have time to answer, but I, I think I've answered most of the questions. <coughs> so um, I'm just going to leave you guys with that. And I want to thank you so much um, for joining me uh, today and for your patience and understanding while I deal with this COVID nonsense. And um, hopefully, I'll, hopefully I'll be back on my legs by next month. And uh, I'm going to take a couple weeks off, um, drive up to, up to the North Cape and probably just sleep in the back seat of the car. <laughs> Well, my wife drives around. She actually has COVID too, so maybe we're not going to go. I don't know. <clears throat> but anyways, yeah, thanks so much for the well wishes. Yeah, <clears throat> and uh, thanks, all you guys. Uh, that's so kind of you. Um, yep. Uh, but yeah, just look. Um, you know, help out Abby if you can, you know. Um, that'll make me happy. And yeah, I've, I've made a donation and I might donate a little bit more later, but you know, just to, even just a little bit is going to help out a lot. So I'm going to leave this up and I'm going to sign off now. I'll just leave it. I'll leave the stream running for a few minutes so people can write this down. Thank you so much for joining me and for your questions and, you know, my Patreon supporters from their support. I mean, some people have been supporting me at a fairly high level for just years and years and years. And I mean, I just, uh, you know, I mean, I, I know that it is tough for us all right now, you know, whether our main gig is music or not. And, you know, um, it's just so kind and so, you know, incredible. And, and, you know, don't think that I don't think that I ever take it for granted or, or don't see like the, the, the greatness of that, that you're showing me. And, and so thank you for that. And, uh, yeah. So like, if you're, if you're not on Patreon yet, just, you know, join as a, join, do take a free membership. You know, you don't have to, it's like, there's no obligation. I'm not going to be pressuring you to up your membership, you know, to paid stuff. You know, I, that's not my way. I'm not into, you know, trying to get tons and tons of views and likes and shit like that. I just, you know, I'm just in this to improve, the level of information for everybody who wants it. All right. So thanks everybody. <clears throat> Have a fantastic holiday. Have an incredible new year and check out the site uh, for, um, for some new uploads coming up soon. All right. All right. Talk to you guys soon. <laughs>